Hi, hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to the Physionic Podcast. If you're familiar, if you're not familiar with who I am, my name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD student in molecular medicine. And well, that's the credential that I'll be using for today as we go through kind of a surface level understanding of a particular study that uh, I was asked to cover sort of indirectly. I was actually asked to cover how fasting affects uh, mitochondrial density. So does it lead to increases in mitochondria? And I ran across this study just kind of trying to investigate that question real quick. And the, this is actually perfect because this study answers that exact question. Uh, the name of the study is called Effects of Prolonged Fasting on AMPK Signaling, Gene Expression, and Mitochondrial Respiratory Chain Content in Skeletal Muscle from Lean and Obese Individuals. So this uh, study is going to be uh, not only looking at individuals who are in kind of a healthy, normal range of body weight, but also people that are uh, overweight to obese. And uh, so it's going to give us some added information. Um, now, I'm going to go ahead and say that the, if you are a fasting enthusiast, although I have a lot of content that covers uh, many of the positives of fasting, uh, this is probably not going to be one of them. Uh, so I was thinking to myself, I'm actually wearing a Tool shirt, which is one of, one of my favorite bands of all time. Uh, one, I think genera generationally, I believe that they're, they're the best uh, rock band of our generation in the last like 20 years or so, 20, 30 years at this point or so, but uh, I digress. So if you'd like to, if you're a fasting enthusiast and you'd like to insult me, Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. Yes, I am a tool. Ha ha, good one, eh? All right, so now that we've moved past that, uh, at least I've gotten one insult, gotten ahead of at least one insult. Let me go ahead and introduce a little bit on this topic, kind of discuss what AMPK is uh, and one other protein, well, actually a few other proteins that are integral and uh, maybe not necessary, but certainly important for the production of more mitochondria. And why would we want higher levels of mitochondria? So obesity is linked to metabolic inflexibility. So the inability for the cells to switch from glucose or blood sugar to fat uh, or from fat to blood sugar. But typically it's more blood sugar towards uh, fat or glycogen to fat, uh, because obviously you want to be able to use up uh, fat molecules. That's the hallmark issue with being uh, over fat. Obviously, you've got too much fat. So this study was performed to see how fasting affects nutrient sensing pathways in over overweight and lean individuals and how those pathways specifically affect mitochondria. So the participants, again, this is going to be pretty surface level. I don't want to go too much into the weeds. There's certainly more data uh, on this study, and surely in the future I'll cover that data as well. Uh, but for the time being, I'm just focused on more so the fasting aspect, as well as the difference between the lean and obese individuals for mitochondria specifically. So obviously, if you have more mitochondria, why you might want more mitochondria is that would then imply that you have potentially greater metabolic flexibility in that you have uh, a greater capacity to burn off fat. There's certainly a lot more to that, but for the let's just run with that interpretation, which is certainly not wrong. Um, so these, par these participants were fasted for 48 hours, and then they had muscle biopsies taken. So you, researchers, what they do is they take a needle uh, and they stick it into their leg after it's been anesthetized, and they take out a piece of muscle, very minute piece. piece. We're talking milligrams of muscle. And uh, then they're able to run experiments on that muscle. And that's how they're able to get a lot of these quantifications of these particular molecules, these particular proteins within the muscle. And then uh, their metabolism was tested. But again, we're not going to be so much focused on the metabolism aspect as we are focused on the mitochondrial aspect. So how does it affect mitochondria? So the measures we're interested in are AMPK, and I'll explain what that is, PGC1-alpha, I'll explain what that is, and mitochondrial complex expression. I'll explain what that is as well. Uh, so 
If you are watching the podcast, as always, if you're listening, don't worry about it. I'll explain things. But if you're watching the podcast, I have an incredibly simplistic graphic that I've created. Uh, ANPK is a master protein that senses the energy state of the cell. And it controls many, many different other proteins or molecules uh, that have function within the cell. However, one of those effects is on PGC1 alpha, which is a really long drawn out name. It's like peroxisome uh, proliferating. It, it's, it's very long. So we just abbreviate it as PGC1 alpha. It's actually something that I studied uh, a little bit during my master's for my thesis, um, looking at mitochondrial biogenesis. So biogenesis, meaning the synthesis, the creation of more mitochondria. So AMPK, when it is upregulated, when it is active, uh, it leads to a greater activity of PGC1 alpha. And typically with a greater activity of PGC1 alpha, so greater activity AMPK, greater activity PGC1 alpha, then you typically see greater increases in the production of mitochondria. Now, before I go on from that, I'd like to also add, so those are two of the proteins that I just mentioned, AMPK and PGC1 alpha that we're interested in. Now, the other proteins are located in the mitochondria and they're a good proxy measure of uh, how much mitochondria are present in the cells that are being collected. So in this situation, we're looking at skeletal cells. So what the researchers can do is uh, do an experiment to figure out the amount of these five other proteins called, uh, they technically have more complex names like succinate dehydrogenase, uh, ATP synthase, and et cetera, et cetera. But for simplicity, they are also called complex one, complex two, three, four, and five. Okay, so that's what I'm going to refer to them as. Uh, but those complexes, those proteins, are found inside the mitochondria. Uh, in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. The mitochondria has two different membranes, but that's not all that important. The point is that if you have more of these proteins, typically it's a good proxy for uh, to, to get, glean the information that you have more mitochondria. And that's the measure that the researchers ended up using. As a matter of fact, that's one of the measures that I used for uh, my thesis. Uh, if you're interested, you can read that. But uh, I doubt anybody's interested in reading a 50-page, or wh however long it was, uh, document on mitochondrial biogenesis. But ultimately, just know that if these proteins increase, that's typically seen as an increase in mitochondria. Okay, now we're all on the same page. Uh, one final thing, and something that we're not going to be touching on, but something that I do think is important, is that AMPK not only affects PGC1 alpha, which increases uh, mitochondrial uh, creation, but it can actually also stimulate autophagy, which is actually what I study now in the lab that I work in, uh, where we study mitophagy, which is specifically mitophagy or specifically autophagy of mitochondria. So the, the cleanup system, the, the degradation of these mitochondrial complexes. So the reason why I'm mentioning this now, because AMPK can also stimulate mitochondrial turnover, meaning not only the greater production of mitochondria, but also the greater degradation of mitochondria. So it has control over both of those, which might be interesting later on. Okay, so now let's look at the first piece of data. There's only three pieces of data. And again, if you're listening to this, don't worry, I'm going to be explaining things. I just like to throw things up on, on screen for, for people who actually want to see the data themselves and have labeled things, uh, hopefully somewhat understandably. So here we're looking at measures of AMPK. So the, the researchers have taken those muscle biopsies and then they're testing for not just any protein, but a particular protein. And that particular protein is AMPK. So obviously, as we know, uh, we know that elevated AMPK would be associated with increases in the act, potential increases in the production of mitochondria. However, uh, what really has to happen is a phosphorylation of that AMPK. So not only can you, should you have more AMPK, you also have to have phosphorylation, meaning that a phosphate molecule is 
lay, is put on this AMPK protein and that activates that protein. So it's like a magic wand. It gets touched by a magic. It's like a, you go from, it's all in rigor. It's rigor mortis. Uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the Harry Potter reference where Hermione, uh, Petrificus Totalis. <laughs> That's it. There you go, Nick. <laughs> so you, you can, uh, you can freeze this AMPK protein and once, sort of, I'm kind of using an analogy here. So it's, it's not active, so it's like frozen. It's not doing anything. And then when it's phosphorylated, it gets released from that frozen state and it then becomes active. So really what we're interested in is not just the, the total amounts of AMPK, but also the phosphorylation of AMPK. So based on this data, it shows, and again, we're looking at lean individuals and overweight individuals or obese individuals. And it's a comparison of before the fasting and then after the two days of fasting, just straight water fasting for two days. And what they find is that there's no difference between the groups, lean individuals compared to obese individuals on their levels of AMPK. However, there's also no difference in the, the amount of AMPK uh, before fasting and after fasting. So no difference. However, again, when we look at the phosphorylated version of AMPK, there is no difference in the lean individuals. And if you're looking at the graphs, I understand how you might look at that and say, well, the black bar is no fasting and the white bar is fasting. Clearly the white bar is lower, but statistically apparently it wasn't different. So let's just assume that's the case. No difference for the lean individuals. However, there was a difference for the obese individuals. So they had a slight increase in the phosphorylation of AMPK. And I probably should have checked this, but um, I think Yes, okay, I did write this down. So AMPK activity was elevated in the obese compared to the lean individuals with fasting. And that is probably more so that the lean individuals had a decrease and the obese individuals maintained their phosphorylated AMPK. So, but ultimately that ends up equating to the obese individuals, the overweight individuals, after 48 hours of fasting, having elevated levels of phosphorylated, therefore activated AMPK. Okay, so hopefully we're on the same page there. Now, the the next part, that the really the last few pieces of data is looking at this PGC1 alpha, right? So I I had mentioned that you've got Phospho AMPK, which is the activated version, will affect PGC1 alpha, and PGC1 alpha will then lead to biogenesis or the creation of more mitochondria. So, what do we find? Well, this is really intriguing because when we look at the PGC1 alpha data, we see that there is no difference in the lean individuals or the obese individuals in terms of the comparison between lean or obese as well as there's no difference from fasting. So fasting has no effect whatsoever. However, and here's where things really pick up, now we're looking at these complexes. So the complexes that I mentioned earlier in the mitochondria, so those five complexes, one, two, three, four, and five. And we're not so much worried about what they do, although they do a series of different things, but we're not so much worried about what they do in this context. We're more so worried about, do they exist? And how much of them exists? And it turns out that when you compare the fasting in the lean did not promote mitochondrial complex units being increased. So no, you didn't see an increase in that measure. Therefore, the idea there is that there isn't an increase in mitochondria from fasting in lean individuals. But what about in obese individuals? And it turns out that obese individuals have a decrease in these mitochondrial proteins. And that is that is not due to fasting. Just to be clear, that's not uh, from, from how I was able to interpret the statistics. It is not saying that fasting is going to decrease by mitochondrial biogenesis or creation of mitochondria. But by comparison, obese individuals, 
have lower levels of these complexes. So they would presumably have lower levels of mitochondria compared to the lean individuals. So that's really the main finding that we have here. So ultimately what, you know, what all of that together with this, this impact of, you know, AMPK, PGC1 alpha, um, what we saw with PGC1 alpha, there were no differences, but with AMPK, we did see a difference only in the obese individuals and more so that the lean individuals had a, a decrease in, AM, in phospho AMPK, the activated version, and the obese individuals maintained their phospho AMPK levels. And yet when that's reflected in the actual measures of mitochondrial complexes, those mitochondrial proteins, we don't see an effect of fasting and we still see an effect of weight, an effect of obesity, not an effect of fasting. So in conclusion, this means that long-term fasting does not increase mitochondria, long-term as in 48 hours, but being overweight is related to having fewer mitochondria. So there you have it, folks. That's the answer. That's what I've got for you. Uh, certainly, you can critique and say, well, uh, you know, did they look at intermittent fasting? Did they look at like a 18 hours of fasting or something or six hours of eating or, you know, whatever it might be? Or, you know, what if they'd done seven days of fasting? It, you know, this is the day that we have. Uh, maybe there are other studies that have been put out there that cover this in more detail in other versions of fasting, but this is a nice, clean throughput paper. Could they have had a few more measures of mitochondria? Sure, definitely. Um, but again, that's stuff that I'll be delving into uh, further in future content. So I'll certainly link that once it's out, but it's going to be, it's going to be a while. Anyway, hopefully you found uh, this informative. And with that, I hope to have the pleasure as always to speak with you in the next one. Have a good one guys. See ya.